Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Ellen, for that awesome introduction. I also want to thank Kara and Alexander, Barbara, and Mike, and all of you for spending your Friday and Saturday with us. Um, I can't wait to explain a little bit more about type and um, how that applies to uh, the work that I do, the map box. So hi, I am Amy Lee, and I'm a cartographer. So the types of responses that I get when I tell people I'm a cartographer are um, a few. One is a photographer, and I think it's maybe because I say it really fast, or they just kind of don't think that they heard cartographer, and so they say maybe photographer. Another response I get is people still design maps. Um, and then I politely ask them if they have a phone. Mobile phones, or as I like to call them, portable mapping devices, um, are the way that we navigate cities and understand our planet. And to some extent, how we spatially understand our environment in general, for better or for worse. Mapbox is a platform, a mapping platform, and it allows developers and designers to add location into their web and mobile applications. It unlocks the traditional GIS or geospatial information systems black box and democratizes map making for developers and designers. Our map design tool, Mapbox Studio allows our users to customize the visuals from the color to the typeface um, and also the data and when the data shows. Our tools open up fresh new ways of thinking about mapping experiences. Yes, so again, I am Amy Lee Walton and I am a designer experience and engagement lead at Mapbox. And it's my mission to get more designers making maps and using our tools um, I create and explore uh, optimized workflows, with map design, I provide examples and ease onboarding to our tools, and I also get to listen to and interact with our users and understand their pain points and try to work with our internal teams to um, update our product roadmaps based on those things. So definitely, once you guys, once I'm done with my talk and you guys start making maps, please hit me up, I would really like to hear and see what you guys create. So Mapbox allows mapping applications to be customized for your product and for your brand, which of course is extremely important. And while you may not have heard of Mapbox, um, you probably already have us in your phone right now. So Lyft and Uber use our technology. Um, we power the Weather Channel, Tinder, Snapchat, Airbnb, and the Lonely Planet. So Mapbox may never be the app in your phone, but will be the power behind the apps in your phone. Okay, so in all fairness, maps are hard. Um, <laughs> this is something that we say a lot at Mapbox. Um, the amount of geophysical data and that's represented in your phone is staggering. But mapping and cartography as a science has been hard from the beginning. And nowadays, we map on our fancy computers um, but old school cartography has become something of a lost art. So, back in the day, um, map makers were dealing with the same basic problems that we're dealing with today and solving today. Um, the first being known and trusted data, unknown and changing data, techniques and limitations, and then specific use cases. So in the 16th century, we have Sebastian Munster, a German cartographer, cosmographer, and scholar who wrote Cosmographia. And this was the earliest German description of the world. And these were some lessons learned from the rare and antique map tour that I took earlier this week with um, Martin Lenn and James Roy. So the known and trusted data, um, they used polymic um, projections and coordinates, and that essentially is a map projection that is a systematic transformation of the sphere into a flattened 2D surface, and that's essentially what map projections are. So shown here is the Johannes Roche map, and this shows the polymigrate 
um, projections as well. And um, this is, again, describing the latitude, the longitude, and more than 8,000 different locations in Europe, in Asia, and Africa. Um, and this is projecting north-oriented, Mediterranean-focused world. So what we're missing here is the Americas, Australasia, and also southern Africa. There's also the unknown changing data. Um, so the 16th century was the age of exploration and discovery. Um, it was uh, a lot of people were doing extensive overseas exploration, bringing back data and narratives about the places and the spaces that they were exploring. Um, and then also there was the commentary on these new lands and the things that they found there, all interwoven into the map and the design. So this was the beginning of globalization, um, bringing an increase in global trade, providing things like gold foil and colors that were not originally available. This is also the dawn of the widespread adoption in Europe of colonialism um, as a national policy. And so many of these discovered lands by Europeans were already inhabited. Um, and from the perspective of the natives, the age of discovery marked the arrival of invaders that brought gifts of disease and the desire to inhabit and dominate these lands by any means necessary. So there's a lot of visuals that kind of articulate that as well. So as far as the techniques and limitations, um, we had woodblock printing and we had movable type. Um, it's easy now to take maps for granted, but they represent the labor of surveyors, explorers, engravers, monks, cartographers, designers, and cramming city names and lakes, mountains, and illustrations all into one map, a uh, single hand-carved wood block, um, and then laying in reverse. I mean, that sounds like a big challenge, right? And then we have the use case. So Sebastian Munster was um, the first advocate to want to bring maps and geographic information to the layman or the normal everyday peasant. Because previously maps were limited to royalty and also to um, monks, you know, people working in biblical areas. Uh, and this was meant to essentially, with these use cases, make it more relatable to um, people who hadn't heard about these explorations and hadn't um, been presented with this information before. So um, Cosmographia was one of the most successful and popular works of the 16th century. It passed through 24 editions um, in 100 years and its success was due to the fascinating woodcuts and also, of course, the legible, digestible type. So fast forward to the late 1920s, um, the unknown and known data had improved at this time and the use case was more expansive, um, but print maps were now this one giant map that all of the information needed to fit into. Um, and so an improved technique was very important at this time to really bring the focus um, to this information. So it was National Geographic Society that decided that the unpredictability and illegibility of setting moving, movable type was unacceptable for their maps. And so they hired Albert H. Bumstead, um, a former surveyor for the U.S. Geogra Geological Survey and also the society's first chief cartographer to basically find an alternate solution to creating type. So they wanted to create a type that would not break down or blur together as you zoom, kind of enlarge or reduce these elements. Um, so Bumstead was a tinkerer and also an inventor, and so he designed a, this illustration, a photographic apparatus um, to help make more legible typing systems. So after a bit of refining, his photo typography process um, was first used in the United States map that was in the 1933 issue of National Geographic. And after a successful implementation of Bumstead's device, another society cartographer, Charles E. Ritterford, was asked to develop new typeface to accompany this process. 
So his typefaces were so beautifully um, accentuating the map and the map features and improved the leg legibility that National Geographic decided that it never really needed to change these. So Ridford later wrote about the importance of design and typography and map making in the journal The Professional Geographer. And he said, the factual content of a map is generally taken for granted. It is the visual experience, particularly on first impression, to which lettering con contributes so much that sometimes determines whether a map is prized or discredited. Oh, there we go. So now we're in the future, or we're in the present, actually. Um, and so this is the age of vector maps. So vector maps are not exactly what you think when you think of vectors. Um, and here's what you need to know. So the maps are essentially not pre-baked. Um, they're not flattened uh, rasters. They're actually dynamic and changeable. So they're more like a PSD than a PNG. Um, and they're drawn in real time in the browser or the device and they can be altered with code. Um, there are three basic parts of vector maps. The first one being um, vector tiles. So this is the data. Uh, this data has to be present for you to be able to style over. Um, the vector tiles essentially are the points, lines, and polygons that make up our natural and man-made planet. So all of the elements like city names, um, administrative boundaries, uh, lakes, bodies of water, land use types, that type of thing. The second piece is the rendered map. So this is what's drawn directly in your browser or your device. Um, it's zoomable from a global, global scale all the way down to street level detail. And essentially, the instructions um, for drawing this map are specified by a GL style specification. And the neat thing about Mapbox Studio is that when you are designing and using the interface, the code is actually being written for you in the background. So you're picking the colors and the fonts and the other specifications, but um, you then have a JSON file that you can download and you can give it to your developer and they will love you for it. And you can integrate that into the SDK, um, add interactivity with JavaScript. They can also bring it into um, 3D using our Unity SDK, um, project it with AR, um, augmented reality, with our AR kit. And they can also use the Qt SDK if they want to put it into in-car navigation. Um, all the things. They can do all the things with this map. And um, you can also keep in mind that it's dynamic and it's changeable. So you can make changes to the map style. And those things also can be coded um, to happen on the fly. So now let's cover the basic problems um, that we were tackling previously uh, now in the age of vector maps. So we're starting with the known and unknown data. So Mapbox, um, sorry, <laughs> Mapbox provides uh, global data. So um, if you're designing with our tools, essentially you'll have access to this data. We have streets data, we have um, traffic data, we have terrain data. And the way that the data works is um, starting with zoom level zero, you're seeing the global, um, the entire global space, and then as you start to zoom in, more data is revealed to you. And this data is curated by our cartography team um, to be optimized for use and also for performance. So all this data is available to you, um, but you get to decide when and where it appears. Um, vector maps allow for smooth zooming, so it's not staggered, as you can see. You're smoothly zooming from global all the way down to street level. And um, controlling the density of the information that you're showing uh, is extremely important. And as you can see, the labels are a part of that density. Um, so you, never, you no longer need to show every single thing on a map um, because the person is going to be zooming in and out. So you actually get to curate when this data appears and when it is shown. So some of the techniques and limitations. Um, so modern maps can be pinched, and they can be zoomed and tilted, rotated all about. And that's what the user is going to do with these maps. Um, so designers need to control things like text positioning, um, offset, translation, anchoring those different translations, and also um, the orientation. 
for the different elements, uh, for the text and the typography, but then also for the icons if you're creating symbols. Um, so these things need to be considered as you design. In addition, we have international glyphs. Um, so when we moved past only Latin characters into CJK, which is uh, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean labels, we needed to expand our GIF library and atlas. Um, so then characters can range for these um, Latin, non-Latin characters. There were a lot more of these, so we had to be able to um, afford for that. In addition, um, we had, a uh, Chinese text does not use spaces for word wrapping, and each character tends to be, um, a, have a word-like meaning. And so new line breaking and character notation rules were also built into um, this uh, library. In addition, we have um, Arabic and Hebrew text, which is written from right to left instead of left to right. And so our engineers had to update that and create new logical order for these strings to be rendered as well. So use cases. Vector maps can serve many use cases um, based on your final output and application. So the general purpose maps, um, we create a core set of maps that you can use. Uh, the first one here on the left side is um, Mapbox Outdoors, and so that's specified for outdoors um, activities, uh, and it highlights um, different types of hiking paths and that so type of thing. And then we also have Mapbox Streets, which, are, which is our general purpose um, map style that you can use pretty much um, for anything. And then we have Light and Dark, which are specifically made for data visualization. So we also have designer styles. So these are my favorite styles. Um, this is, these are more thematic. Uh, these are styles that you can add to your account. You can take a look at the layers and see how um, different designers on the Mapbox design team and the Mapbox designers that work all over the team, how they applied um, different um, filters and added different images and icons and all kinds of different things. And so you can really explore how those thematic maps are created. Um, so, in addition, we have the use case of um, education and exploring kind of this visual design element. And so, I did a residency uh, with a flex workshop um, at MICA and worked with undergraduate graphic design students and essentially taught them how to design a map and add interactivity using JavaScript. And this was a three-week um, course. Uh, and the students really picked it up quickly and were able to make these animations. Um, and as you scroll up for the page, you're able to actually see um, the narrative, and the narrative is paired with a map moving to different locations. So I'm quickly gonna run through uh, some styles that I've created. Um, this is a map style that was um, uh, influenced by Roy Lichtenstein. And I wanted to capture that pop art look and feel, and so I used typeface, also used um, color, um, and different elements to really capture and translate that visual. I was also inspired by Swiss topo maps, and so I created a Swiss um, ski map. And I created a vintage map as well, um, again, inspired by the old-timey texture and look and feel. Uh, wanted to create a map that really showed that detail and that information. So now I'm gonna walk a little bit through my process for designing a map. And this is the latest map that I did called Cali Terrain. This map was inspired by my first ever trip to LA and I'm that person that sits in the window seat and takes pictures the whole plane ride, essentially. Um, and so I was doing that and becoming more and more inspired by seeing Southern California, um, the Grand Canyons, different reservations, thinly populated deserts and also mountains um, in San Bernardino County. So for this map, um, I used terrain heavily, and I also wanted to mimic the Earth's texture and tone with the colors. In addition, I'm pulling in some extra data sources. Uh, in addition to Mapbox Streets, I'm pulling in a DEM, which is a digital elevation model for the hillshades. And you can see that data here. Um, what 
you have is um, different levels and classifications of shadow and also of highlights. And so you can decide to color those elements differently. I also use natural earth bathymetry data. And so this is essentially the measurement of the depth of water. Um, and I use this, uh, you can see this data here, to just add a little bit of flavor to um, the water style. And finally, I used Mapbox Satellite. So um, I wanted to, as you zoom in, really have a lot more information um, there. Thank you. So quickly, I'm going to show you the design system. So the four major elements that I look at are color, typography, iconography, and texture. Um, so this is a taxonomy chart. Um, we iterate through um, creating these types of charts uh, within the cartography team at Mapbox. Um, this is the latest version done by my col or created by my colleague Nat. And essentially, this process takes time. I didn't just jump into Illustrator and create this. It's very iterative. Um, typically, I choose the fonts and the colors, and then kind of go back and forth between Mapbox Studio and the Illustrator document to kind of have the final look of you know, all of the elements and all of the color and all of, all of the things for the map in one place. So the color, again, an earth tone. Um, I have these different hues, but I pulled the saturation down to the same level for all of them and also used the same kind of lightness um, for them as well. I usually do about seven to 12 colors for a map to keep it simple. Um, I'm using two different typefaces, Overpass, which is inspired by Highway Gothic, and then Allegra, which is a uh, dynamic serif font, and essentially I use that for the POIs, points of interest, like the parks and the glaciers. So then this is the iconography, um, and this essentially can really make or break your map. This is what helps people know where they are. This is what shows you the points of interest, which are like, you know, coffee shops, libraries, museums, that type of thing. And it really helps to make your map a lot more navigable. And with texture, um, I applied an uh, interesting effect using hill shades. So I used a lot of earth tones, but I used blue um, as a complementary color to actually highlight some of the hill shades. And so you get that play in the different locations. More hill shades. And you know, once you have all your basic elements, then together you start to um, alter uh, a lot of the um, hierarchy and really play with the contrast. This map was very hard because there wasn't a lot of contrast. And so I really had to use classifications of the data and different stylistic methods with the typography to create hierarchy. Um, and then also density is a big part of it, deciding what shows when, how much information you want to show for context, and not overwhelming the viewer um, with that information. And then legibility, making sure that at a quick scan you can see this information. And this is Mapbox Studio just working. I don't work this fast. This is sped up, obviously. Um, but really using the data and going back and forth between those two elements to um, create the design. So I'm very passionate about teaching other designers to make maps because we have a lot of developers that are um, using our tools, but I really want more designers. So I actually wrote a small book about um, map design, and I have some copies here. So please come grab me if you're interested. And if you take a book, you have to make a map. So I'd be excited to see what you guys create. Um, and feel free to hit me up, email me, hit me on Twitter. You can also download this um, guide as a PDF version from this link. Thank you. Thank you.